Hello everyone, it's 1 p.m. Eastern Time and that means it's time to begin another Kokoros Weather Talk webinar. Hi, I'm your host Henry Regis. Along with me today is Kokoros founder Nolan Duskin. We're coming to you live from the Colorado Climate Center at Colorado State University here in Fort Collins, Colorado. Today we bring you flash floods. It's more than a bunch of rain. Our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by grants from NOAA's Office of Education and the National Science Foundation. And all of these webinars are recorded for future viewing. After our speaker's presentation today, we'll open up the webinar for questions from our audience. With us today is Matt Kelsch from Boulder, Colorado. Matt is a hydrometeorologist at UCAR in Boulder and a Kokoros coordinator here in Colorado. Matt has been recording daily weather since he was 10 years old. Welcome, Matt. It's great to have you with us today. Thanks, Henry, and good morning to everyone in the mountain time zone and time zones west of us, and good afternoon to those of you in the central and eastern time zone. As Henry said, my talk today is going to be flash floods, more than a bunch of water. My background is in meteorology. I grew up in Long Island, New York, got a bachelor's degree in meteorology in Oswego, New York. My graduate degree in meteorology was at the University of Oklahoma, and I moved to Colorado in 1986 and have been here ever since then in, in Boulder, Colorado. Although I'm interested in all aspects of meteorology, and I've worked in all aspects of meteorology, my expertise is in what we call hydrometeorology, the, the branch of meteorology that deals with water, either too much, like flooding, or too little, like drought. Today, of course, I'm talking about flash flooding, and the real take-home point I hope to make by the end of this, this talk is that while rainfall is an important trigger to flash flooding, there's a lot of other processes that go on, dangerous processes, and even this photograph is kind of giving you a feel for that. This is from the Fort Collins flash flood, Fort Collins, Colorado, the 28th of July, 1997, and this is typical of what happens in flash floods. You get hazardous and flammable materials involved when propane tanks and trailers and gas lines and everything start to snap and break. Um, you could get explosions and toxic materials. So this is what makes flash floods so dangerous. So what I'm going to do in the beginning of this talk, first I'll go through the definition, and the beginning of the talk will be more about the bunch of rain that leads to a flash flood, but then it's about the other processes, what we call the hydrologic processes, what happens to that water once it's on the ground. The definition of a flash flood that the National Weather Service uses is a flood that follows within six hours, often less than one hour, of intense rainfall. That's the important thing for this webinar. I'm focusing on the intense rainfall. But it also includes rapid flooding from dam or levee failures or the sudden rise of water associated with a river ice jam, that, ice jam that those of you in northern areas would have to deal with from time to time. These photographs are from just last August. The remnants of Hurricane Irene caused some severe flash flooding from New Jersey to Vermont. These two in particular were taken in Vermont. In some cases, covered bridges that have been around for several centuries were destroyed during that particular flash flood event. Now, I asked a question when you registered for this, how quickly you think a flash flood follows rainfall. It was nice to see most of you said six hours or less. A lot of you said 15 minutes or an hour, which actually is true. Some of them come together that quickly, and I'll get into that later in the talk. What I want to talk about is more specifically, that was the general definition. It's the relationship between precipitation, the stuff you're measuring with your Kokoraz gauge, and the basin response, or the watershed response, that leads to rapid rises in stormwater. So what I'm really saying there is if you live in a sandy area and it's been a dry period like the coastal plains of the East Coast or the sand hills of Nebraska, it would have to rain really hard and for a long time to get some serious flooding going. On the other hand, if you live in an area that has very thin soils, there's a lot of rock or there's a lot of clay, which I'll get into later, doesn't absorb water very well, or it's an urban environment, we have a lot of pavement, it doesn't have to rain as hard. The watershed, or the basin we call it, will respond very quickly to just a small amount of rain that comes down in, in an intense rate. So in some areas, it could be one inch and a half an hour can trigger a really bad flash flood. In other places, it might take six inches before you get anything going. So the rainfall is intense in a flash flood with respect to the watershed's ability to accommodate it. These two photographs, I just want to point out, these are both from the Cheyenne, Wyoming flash flood of 1985. There was a tremendous amount of hail fall with that flood on August 1st, and that's what you see in the photograph up here. This is hail 
that remained on the ground after the floodwaters had moved through. And the hail actually plugged up storm drains and stuff, which, which enhanced the flood. And this is um, Dry Creek in Cheyenne, where the road was eaten away because the culverts couldn't accommodate the water coming to them. And, and this is why driving and roadways can be very dangerous in flash floods, as um, creeks that go under roads, that's often a choke point for the floodwaters, where they can't get through and, and actually break through the road embankment itself. So the precipitation, there's something called regenerative convection. Convection is just a shower. It's those cauliflower looking clouds you see, the cumulus clouds that build up. And when they get really big and organized, they become showers and eventually thunderstorms. That's what produces the intense rainfall rates that, that drive our, um, our flash floods. But a lot of convection or thunderstorms doesn't last very long in any one place. So those don't produce flash floods. It's the ones that regenerate, or the regenerative ones, that keep forming in the same place over and over again that become the flash flood problems. And what we need for that to happen is a lot of moisture that's being replenished and something to lift the atmosphere. When you lift the atmosphere, when you go up in elevation, the atmosphere cools, the, the moisture in it condenses as it, cools, as, in the, as it cools and the rain comes out. So more specifically, for intense precipitation, you need a large area of moisture, which I show in the green here, and a very specific area of lift. This blue line here I have could be a stationary cold front. Cold air is more dense than warm air, and I have a little graphic to show you that. We all know that mountains can cause the air to be uh, lifted as, as in wind flow comes into the mountains. It gets pushed up into the mountains. But a stationary front or a cold front does the same thing, because behind a cold front, this is the cold air behind the cold front. Think of it as this, this area of dense air that's against the surface, and the warm air then rides up and over it. When these areas become stationary and you have a lot of moisture coming into it, the red circles here represent individual thunderstorms developing. And they develop and move with the east to west steering flow. It could be other directions, but I have it drawn as east to west here. And eventually they dissipate. But as long as these features remain in the same place, you get repeated areas of thunderstorms keep forming and moving over the same area. So this green area could be something really large, like several states extending from the Gulf of Mexico to Ohio or something like that. Whereas these can be something on the order of a county, where you get these little thunderstorm cells develop, and they just keep, you get these repeated bursts that can last for four or six hours. The rain gets real heavy. It lets up for a few minutes, and another big heavy burst. And over four or six hours, you could get five, six, seven, eight inches of rain fall in one area. That's what drives the, the um, intense precipitation that leads to flash flooding. An example of that, um, this is the infamous Kansas Turnpike flood. I know there are some people from Kansas on, on the call. You might remember this from August 30th of 2003. Um, what I have here, the, the white lines are the county lines in eastern Kansas, so we're really zoomed in on eastern Kansas. This pink line is I-35, or the Kansas Turnpike. And the reds and oranges here are the intense thunderstorms that developed along a stationary front that was right in here. So moist air was coming up from the Gulf of Mexico. Thunderstorms kept developing along the interstate and moving northeast and dissipating, while new ones kept developing and, and taking their place. Over a period of about three hours, between six and eight inches of rain fell in a small area of Chase and Lyon County, Kansas. And what happened that night is water surged over the interstate along Jacob Creek, which normally goes under the interstate, washed away some of those Jersey barriers, those giant concrete barriers that go down the middle of an interstate, and you can see all the downstream erosion here. The disaster that occurred is the severe flash flood surged across the interstate. Again, as I said, this tiny area upstream of the interstate, and we have this, we're kind of simulating what happened here, we're looking downstream at I-35. This is the culvert that takes Jacob Creek underneath the interstate. Upstream of the culvert, where we are, like on this side of the culvert, six to eight inches of rain fell in three hours in an area that was only about two square miles. The water became impounded um, along the interstate. When it could no longer pass through the culvert, it started coming up onto the Kansas Turnpike. Couldn't get past those Jersey barriers. Between 8.30 and 9 p.m., you start getting the creek onto the road, and cars started uh, slowing down, and eventually they had to stop. They couldn't make it through. By 9 o'clock, 
the water was at the depth of those barriers and started spilling over to the other side. People were making emergency 911 calls for help, but at this point, traffic jams had formed a mile to a mile and a half in either direction, so emergency crews couldn't get there to see what was going on. Number of people started abandoning their cars between 9 and 9.25. They were encouraged by someone on foot that was telling them to get out of the cars and come to a drier portion of the interstate. Some people stayed with their cars because they were banked up against these giant concrete barriers that you wouldn't think were going to go anywhere. And about 9.30 p.m., just the force of the water and the weight of the cars up against the barriers caused 12 of those barriers to break loose. And the barriers, as well as seven vehicles, went a mile and a half downstream. There were uh, six fatalities with that particular um, flash flood event. It's interesting that the vehicle that went a mile and a half downstream, the one that was the furthest, was featured in an ad in the USA Today that you often see with SUVs that these are extra safe in floods. And that ad um, looked like this. It basically tells you that um, these are supposed to be insurance policies for avalanche, mudslide, flood, tornado, and earthquake. And it says Jeep Grand Cherokee is still the best insurance policy out there. And of course, nature always teaches us that no matter what the vehicle is, they're not boats. They will get swept downstream and eventually sink. Now, I already showed you this graphic. This is, um, again, the moisture coming together into a specific area of lift. But that lift can also be a topographic feature. So that's what the next graphic is going to show. In this case, for the Appalachians or the Rockies, um, you might get moisture coming out of the east, like off the Gulf Stream and, and um, on the east coast, or Gulf of Mexico moisture coming off the plains into Wyoming or Colorado. And it's the same kind of thing, where you get thunderstorms start to develop, they move and dissipate, but they keep regenerating, the regenerative convection, in the same area. And a lot of the big flash flood events in both the Appalachians and the Rockies have been this kind of setup, where you have the storms moving along the axis of the mountains, but reforming in the same place over and over again, over a period of four or six hours. One of the um, classic events that looked like that was the Port Collins flood that I already mentioned of the 28th of July, 1997. I know this is a busy graphic, so let me explain some of the stuff on it. Um, we're looking in northeast Colorado now. Denver is down here, the Denver airport. The mountains are on this side of, of the graphic. And this right here is actually a reservoir, this blue thing, that's west of Fort Collins and above Fort Collins. It's in the foothills. And the two beige lines are some of the major highways, Interstate 25 and what we call US Highway 287, which is a major thoroughfare in Fort Collins. Fort Collins sits right here. And this road, this beige line, is College Avenue, a major road to Fort Collins. The storms were developing on the southwest side of Fort Collins and over a period of five hours kept moving and dissipating as they moved to the northeast, but over the same area, over and over again, causing about 10 inches of rain to fall in a five-hour period. And this is zooming in on Fort Collins. This is that reservoir I was talking about, Horse Tooth Reservoir. The first prominent row of foothills is right here. And so this blue line here is Spring Creek only drains about 12 or 13 square miles from the foothills to where this red X is. And this is the, the dark lines of the rainfall analysis. Thank Nolan Duskin for this fine analysis. Spring Creek, you'll notice, takes a little bit of a jog right here. And I don't know if you can make it out, but there's a hatch line here that indicates a railroad. That railroad sits on top of a 15-foot earthen embankment, and this little jog here is unnatural. The creek is redirected along the upstream side of that embankment and then through a series of culverts. A lot of cities do this. This is part of the flood control. This area, just upstream of the railroad embankment, is designed to hold back excess water during a flood. In fact, this was designed to hold back the 500-year flow and only let the 100-year flow through. So what happened that night is all this water is coming down, and this 500-year retention area, actually we call this a detention pond, this 500-year detention pond completely filled up and started spilling over the railroad tracks while a freight train was crossing into a trailer court where this red X was located. The trailer started to float. You can see the, the, the images down here. When they float, their gas and electric lines break. Um, we started getting fires and explosions and people needing to be rescued. And, and five people or four people died in the trailer court, and a fifth person died downstream by that other red X here um, when the water surged into the neighborhoods downstream from the trailer court. So what I'm going to show now is a, a, a video of what the firefighters, the rescuers, faced when they reached the area, as soon as it gets loaded up here. 
I hear my computer buzzing, so it's it's loading the video, and here we go. So what you're going to see is some of the flooding that occurred that night. So first, this is just the floodwaters that were moving through the city, just from that 10 inches of rain that fell, trying to get downstream. The city is spoke from west to east. This is about 10.30 at night, 11 o'clock at night, this is happening. This is at the trailer court. You can see pieces of the trailer now floating along. And they're floating over College Avenue, which is a six-lane wide major highway in this part of town. So again, fires break out. This is pretty typical in flash floods in urban areas, hazardous and flammable material. You'll see a double wide trailer here in a moment. And so the rescuers are trying to get in. You'll see they're going to have they're having trouble with this particular piece of equipment because it's really not designed for flash flood rescue. The engine was getting choked with debris and and stuff like that. These guys managed to get out, but this was a pretty dangerous situation. They are on College Avenue now, that major highway through the city. And this is all occurring within a couple hours of the peak rainfall, actually within an hour and a half. Okay, so that's when I talk about the hydrologic response later, keep that video in mind of, of, of how dangerous it gets. But now what I want to talk about is a little bit about radar. This is one of the important tools, but it's not a perfect tool. So if here's, this is where our radar is. Um, one of the problems if you live in an area with mountains um, is often the information the radar is trying to get about rainfall is blocked by the mountains. So they only see the tops of the storm. And what's happening in the top of the storm and what's coming out the bottom of the storm are not always the same thing. So the radar might give some misleading information about rainfall. Um, also, as you get a large distance from the radar, the, the radar beam that samples the precipitation or records how much energy is in the precipitation is getting higher and higher in the atmosphere, again, less correlated with what's coming out at the bottom of the storm. But radar is an excellent tool for its spatial and, and uh, spatial resolution and its time resolution, but your gauge reports really provide important measurements for comparison and calibration of the radar tool. Um, with radars, when you look at it, if we were to look at just the specific drops in the thunderstorm, sometimes they contain, or many times, they contain hail, that's what these things are showing, small hail, and ice and snow, as well as a mixture of raindrops. Even in places where it's raining at the ground, often there's ice involved with how the precipitation forms in the cloud. In other locations, particularly more tropical locations, there tends to be all liquid in the storm. And the problem with radar precipitation is when there's ice involved, um, it reflects more, like hailstones reflect more, so it looks stronger. The storm looks stronger and the radar thinks it's raining harder there. But often in these storms with a lot of liquid, even though they don't look as strong because the, the, the particles aren't as big, the raindrops and the hailstones aren't as big, so there's not as much energy reflected, these are producing higher rainfall rates. And although we could say, yeah, in Florida and Hawaii it usually looks like this, and in Montana and North Dakota it usually looks like this, there's a lot of variability. And so the radar could be misleading if um, there's a day where you're expecting there should be hail in the clouds, but it's actually all water, and the radar doesn't give you um, a rainfall intensity that's high enough. That's where the gauges come in, is really helping us calibrate what the radar is showing. 
because the rainfall rate from the radar is reflected is related to the energy reflected, and that's related to the type of precipitation in the cloud. And we don't always know what type of precipitation is in the clouds. The gauges really the gauge reports really help us get some ground measurement to, to help calibrate those those radar estimates. But gauges aren't perfect either, and we have to keep in mind some of the limitations with those. I have a question here. I know you can't answer out loud, but there are a number of limiting factors, including maintenance and so forth, particularly with automated gauges. And Kokoraz gauges are manual, which makes it a lot simpler and easier to maintain. We visit them every day so we can tell if something happened, if a bird's building a nest or whatever. Automated gauges do tend to have more problems. But wind is the biggest problem for all gauges. And as a general rule of thumb, and this is just a general rule of thumb, there's a 1% loss in what the gauge catches for every one mile per hour of wind. So that would be a 10% loss with the wind of 10 miles per hour. But this varies a lot. Big drops aren't going to get deflect deflected by the wind as much. Little drops like drizzle drops and snow will get deflected by the wind a lot more. Automated gauges, not the kind you're using, but we're often used, um, basically the, the water is funneled down into the gauge, into these little like seesaw type um, equipment, and these flip back and forth when a certain amount of water hits them, and then we, they click every time it flips back and forth, and we count how many clicks there are, and that's how, how we know um, how much rain fell. But these gauges can do pretty poorly when the pace of the, the rainfall or the, the intensity is very high. Hail may bounce out of them, and they don't do very well with snow. Now the Kokoraz gauges, of course, don't have those problems with electronic parts and things like that. But I want to show you a little something about the wind. So here's our gauge. In a perfect situation, there is no wind, and the rain is coming straight, straight down. The ideal catch is exactly what's falling into the gauge. We have a perfect measurement or a near-perfect measurement. But as soon as we increase the winds, let's make it about 22 miles per hour, the rain starts falling at an angle. And the ideal catch, which is the full opening of the gauge, compared to the effective catch, you could see the gauge can't catch quite as much of the rain as the wind speed gets higher. Compensating that, the gauge itself, and again I'm showing a Kokoraz gauge here, causes some turbulence as the wind flows over it. And that turbulence kind of turns the angle of the rainfall, the pathway, more in the vertical, which is a good thing. The problem is a lot of time that effect is downwind of the gauge, where the turbulence is more, um, more pronounced as the wind goes over the gauge. Many gauges out there, not the Kokoraz ones, but the automated ones, have something we call wind screens around them to try to induce that turbulence and make the, the rain come down into the gauge. And I'll show a picture of that actually next. So just expect in decent exposure with good maintenance and winds less than 15 miles per hour, you probably have errors that are less than 15%. That's good gauge report. But these errors become greater with stronger wind, and if you have poor exposure, like if it's right next to your house or under a tree, um, and poor maintenance, which again, that's not as much of an issue with the Kokoraz gauges, because we kind of visit them every day and we can see what's going on, but those become more of an issue with automated gauges. Here's a, a picture of an automated gauge that the Weather Service uses, and these things you see around the gauge, both an inner circle and an outer circle, are the windscreens. The, the idea of them is to to cause some turbulence, slow the wind speed down, and, and turn the path of the rain or the snow more into the vertical so the gauge could catch it more accurately. Okay, so that was the rainfall. Now I want to move into the hydrologic response. This is where I say flash floods are more than a bunch of rain. What happens to that water once it's on the ground? Well, the first thing we have to think about is the condition of the soil, not only the type of soil, but how wet it is. What this map is showing is surface soil types around the United States, Alaska and Hawaii are in here. I apologize for those listening from those areas. Um, but there are three basic types of, of um, soil. There's clay, which is the smallest particle. These are really the fine, almost dusty-like particles. And even when clay is dry, it only absorbs water very slowly. So if it's raining real hard and you've had a drought, but you have clay soils like you see in these pink areas, Mississippi Valley, Texas, parts of the Dakotas, that water is coming off the top. It's not going into the ground. You have a big flash flood risk. Silt is medium size. It absorbs water a little faster. And sand is the largest particle, meaning it has the biggest pore space. So sand can really absorb water very fast. 
So the coastal plains of the East Coast around the Great Lakes, the sand hills of Nebraska, um, these areas are going to absorb water very well. So in these areas, it becomes more important whether or not the ground is already wet. If the ground's already wet, then those pore spaces are, are filled with water and not much more water is going to go into the ground. But if the ground is dry, those areas are going to take in a lot of rain before you get a flash flood. Now in the west, it's a little bit misleading. Um, it shows a lot of sandy areas, but what this map doesn't show is how deep the soil is. And in the desert southwest and the Great Basin in particular, the soil profiles tend to be very thin. The layer of soil between soil and rock isn't very deep when you compare it to something like the Pacific Northwest or Alaska or, or the eastern United States. So you could saturate the soil very quickly in these areas because of the very thin soil pro profiles. I think that's also a problem in parts of Hawaii where you have the lava lying right underneath a thin soil layer, but there are probably other parts of the islands that have very deep soil profiles. Now, continuing with this idea of the effect of soil, fire, especially in the western United States, is a big issue for increasing flash flood risk. And this photograph from Los Alamos, New Mexico, um, shows when a flood came through after a fire, it was carrying so much sand and debris that it knocked all the bark off the lower parts of the tree when the flood came through, the, the burnt trees. Um, intense fires can cause the soil to exceed 500 degrees Celsius, even get up to 850 degrees Celsius. And when that happens, all of the organic material in the soil gets vaporized, as well as the organic material above the soil. And some of the, sand, some of the particles fuse together and become bigger particles. So if you had little soil particles like silt or clay, they could fuse together and become more sand-like. But the most important thing, and why this is a bigger problem in the West than some Eastern locations, is pine trees burn very hot. Coniferous forests. And when they burn, their oils and resins vaporize and then settle back out into the soil and cause this water-repelling surface. Deciduous trees don't burn quite as hot and don't have as much um, of the oils and resins, which is why some of the forests in New England won't have as much of an impact if they burn as the forests in some of the western United States. But anyway, when that happens, the vapor with all these oils and resins um, moves down through the soil until it reaches the cooler soil further down. And you don't have to go that far down. Even if the soil in the fire is 500 degrees Celsius, about an inch or two down into the soil, you're already hitting the cooler stuff. The vapor condenses. The oils and resins come out in the soil and create a water-repelling layer in the soil parallel to the burnt surface. So it looks something like this. This is before the fire. And this top one here might represent something in the eastern U.S. where you have a lot of deciduous trees mixed with some conifers. In these areas, you tend to have a lot of forest litter. So the biggest impact of fire is it removes all the leaf litter, you know, twigs and stuff that absorb water like a sponge and hold it rather than letting it just go downstream. So that's the big sort of buffer you have against flash floods before a fire. In the west, the, the, the forest litter doesn't tend to be as deep. But you do get a little bit of a semi-impermeable layer just because pine trees, again, have the, the saps and the oils. But the real difference comes after the fire. Now, it looks something like this. After a fire in those deciduous eastern forests, um, you have a layer of ash. But the biggest impact is you remove that deep forest litter layer that no longer is there to absorb water. So you might get more runoff. In the west, there's even a bigger impact, and I guess the southeast has a lot of con coniferous forests too, so this would be a concern down there as well. You get that really bad burnt area where all the organic material is out, the particles fuse together, it's very sand-like. So this, this area, which might be about an inch, maybe two inches deep, can absorb water very, very easily, but immediately below it, where all those oils and resins settled out, the water is not going anywhere except downhill. It's not going deeper into the soil. So now imagine it starts to rain, the water starts to beat up on the ash surface, the water starts to follow pathways downhill and digs what we call rills or gullies into the burnt surface and gets down into that, that layer that could absorb water. It becomes saturated, very heavy, and then because of the weight, you get a slope failure like you see down here. So it would look something like this. It starts to rain, the rain starts to work its way into this sort of wettable layer right there. Um, that's very sand-like, but it can't get through the red layer, except occasionally you get breaks in this, 
this red water repelling layer where you have like a tree stump or a boulder. And at those locations, you could get a slope failure. When the slope fails, it's more than water. You get giant boulders and mud and everything going downstream, what we call debris flows. If you're immediate downstream of a slope failure, the flash flood will contain very large rocks and boulders. A mile or two downstream, the larger stuff has already settled out and you get a lot of mud. The video you're about to see, this is in Southern California near Los Angeles where there had been a slope failure, and we're a couple miles downstream, so you'll see a lot of muddy water coming through. Now you notice there are a lot of little tree branches and stuff, but it, it, it's muddy water, but still very dangerous. This is not something you're going to be able to swim out of. And this is happening about two hours after the, the start of the heavy rain. So that's an example of what it looks like a mile or two downstream of a slope failure. This one, I'm going to have to get out of the PowerPoint to play this. This is one that occurred near San Bernardino in, on Christmas Day 2003. This one actually made national news because 16 people died in a, um, in, a, a flat, in a campground when the flash flood came through. But you'll see, actually before I start this, um, let me, oops. you'll see when you look at these big boulders here, notice the water is not very deep compared to the size of the boulder. It's less than halfway up the boulder, but you'll see they're being pushed along as other rocks and the water keeps pushing it. And if a boulder will move along in a flood like this, you can imagine how easy it is for a car to move along in a major flood. So let's get this going. So there you see, now watch how that big boulder there, how it's going to get pushed along. And this is less than a mile downstream of the slope failure. So you still have all these big rocks and boulders that are part of the flash flood. And in many cases, people who die in flash floods don't drown. They die from traumatic injury because of situations like this. Okay, so let me go back to this. Um, on that very same street where that was taken, this is some of the, the rocks and sand and stuff that piled up against the houses from that flash flood. In grasslands, fires don't have as much of an impact. Grassland fires are not as hot, so there is actually a tendency to promote increased vegetation and regrowth after the fire. Now one of the biggest impacts is urbanization. When we look at flash floods around the country, a bigger and bigger proportion are happening in, in urban environments with seemingly modest amounts of rain. So there are two big impacts in urban areas. One, you get more runoff just because you have parking lots and all these impervious surfaces. But the one people don't tend to think about that's just as important is you have more rapid runoff. Cities and even suburban environments have a well-developed storm drain system and a road grid and they channelize streams. And all of these increase the speed, they act as tributaries, many, many tributaries, unnatural tributaries, but they take the water and move it to the nearest low spot or stream much faster than it would in the natural environment. If we have a big rainstorm, and this is time increasing here, and this is the, the height of the river increasing in this direction, so this is flood stage here, in a natural environment or a rural environment that we show in a green, the water comes up after a rainstorm, but doesn't necessarily hit flood stage and then comes back down. In a suburban environment, where you still have water that can go into the ground, but you have all the storm drain systems, so things happen real fast, it could be the same amount of water that you had in a rural environment, but now it happens faster, so you could reach flood more. Um, and then in a truly urbanized environment, you have more water because of all the concrete, and it's really fast. So you get this really big peak for sometimes relatively small amounts of rain. So let's kind of summarize. In an urban environment, you decrease the roughness of the surface. I know when you're driving along parking lots and stuff, it might seem rough to you, but compared to a natural surface with trees and shrubs and rocks, parking lots and concrete line channels are very smooth and the water will move very fast. This is actually a, a series of parking lots in Richmond, Virginia, August of 2004 when Hurricane Gaston was moving through. And you probably can't make it out, but the cars are being swept together in the parking lot downstream because it's just total runoff here. Nothing's going into the ground. 
you also increase the stream density. That refers to the number of tributaries. Even though the natural tributaries are often gone in an urban environment, all of the storm drain system and the road grid act as tributaries. And you increase the slope, because what happens is often we straighten out creeks in urban environments. So to go from the top of the drainage to the bottom, if it's meandering, it's going to travel a much bigger difference than if it's just a straight line. And often in urban environments, we take a meandering stream and we make it straight, which in a sense increases the slope and that speeds up the water. This is a, a, a photograph from near Pittsburgh. And this is an example of a stream that's squeezed between buildings, straightened out, lined with concrete, and pointed downhill. So that really increases the, the flash flood risk downstream from this area. Urban streams, when they've been urbanized, want to become wider and deeper than their rural state. In fact, studies show that in urbanized area, the streams will need to hold two to three times what they originally needed to hold it during a big rainstorm. But many urban streams aren't allowed to get bigger and deeper, like this one that flows under an elementary school in the suburbs of Pittsburgh. Um, and so that's a really high-risk area for not only having a flash flood, but having a flash flood with a human impact. The other thing that's interesting is not only urbanization increases the risk of flash flood, but it increases the risk of water shortage at the same time. In a um, natural environment, when it rains, a, num a lot of the water is going to go into the ground and recharge the deep storage, and a little bit goes off into the stream. In an urban environment, a lot of the water goes into the nearest stream, and only a little bit goes into the ground. So you could set up to enhance a drought situation. At the same time, you're enhancing a flash flood situation. There was a study done in Baltimore. It's really interesting in showing what happens in urban environments. Hopefully someone from Baltimore is on this call or in that area. Um, but this is applicable to any city. What I'm showing here is a drainage called Morris Run. It's only nine square miles, kind of a long, skinny drainage. And it's densely residential. It's not truly urbanized where it's all concrete. There's a lot of yards and trees and stuff. But it's densely residential. And this on the left here shows its natural state in 1935 before the urbanization. So the blue are all the natural tributaries. Today, the only stream channel above ground you see in the lower part of the basin, but that doesn't mean there aren't tributaries. There are actually a lot more now. They're all the storm sewer and storm drain system and the road grid and so forth. In June of 2003, June 13th, a heavy storm passed across this area. And this it was well instrumented. They were studying the effects of urbanization on runoff. And I'm going to show you a stream gauge from right here, Radicky Avenue, which is a four-lane highway. Um, the rain didn't even really hit that hard here. It hit up here. And you'll see how fast this area responds. So first, this is Radicky Avenue. This is just the lower part of that drainage where the channel is visible. The water floods over Radicky and Sinclair Avenues, both major highways through the area, and even impacted some of the properties as it came out of the stream. How fast did that happen? So let me orient you to what this graph is showing. These are the rainfall rates here in millimeters per hour. So 50 is about 2 inches per hour, and 100 is about 4 inches per hour. And this is time. The dashed lines are every 5 minutes, going like this. So the red is the rainfall rate. And let's just pay attention to the black. That's the stream gauge at Radicky Avenue. So the rainfall peaked at a little over 2 inches per hour, came down, and then peaked at about 3 and a half inches per hour, only for about 10 minutes. And 16 minutes after that, there was already flooding on Radicky Avenue. That's how fast it came together. They also calculated that a little bit under two inches of rain fell, but a lot of it went into the ground. 60% went into the ground, um, a little, about three quarters of an inch, or um, 17 millimeters, was what was runoff, what moved across the surface. And it was this 40% of the rain, this amount, that caused this flooding into properties and the major highways 16 minutes after the peak rainfall rate. That's the impact of urbanization. And it's not just humid areas like Baltimore. This is um, Las Vegas. Let me explain some of the features on here, because again, I have a lot of busy um, graphics. The yellow outlines are Las Vegas and its subdivisions. So consider that the urban area outlined by all those yellow lines. The color image is topography, or the mountains. The yellows and reds over to the west here and up to the north are the higher terrain. We have a valley coming down into Las Vegas from both the northwest and northeast. Las Vegas tends to slope from northwest to southeast, and Lake Mead is down here. The storm, you'll see this white circle here. The storm hit 
along the northwest side of the city, and all those little white lines are individual drainages or watersheds that feed into the city and through the city. Notice they're really kind of long and skinny. We tend to see that in areas with, with terrain changes. So the storm fell here, and these long, skinny drainages channeled the water into the city, where it overwhelmed the storm sewer and storm drain system and caused severe flash flooding where this white circle is. So I'm going to zoom in on that. That white circle is the same as where this blue circle is, the northwest side of Las Vegas. The water pours into the city. The storm culverts and stuff couldn't, couldn't handle it. So the water starts moving through the city streets to the east and south, which is the slope of the city. And many of the properties actually stay dry, but the streets became extremely dangerous and was very localized. Here's a photograph of the rescuers, the fire department, being rescued by this helicopter dude here. Um, and if you look, you could see in the very short distance the crowd of people watching the action. So this is just the floodwaters moving through the street, but there were dry areas all around town. And this video actually from that particular flooding in Las Vegas, you may have seen this, I've seen it on shows. This person has not been washed into a creek or a drainage. Her car is on one of the major city streets and she's being rescued. The car is fortunately caught up on something and isn't being swept downstream. You should see how high velocity that water is. But when they pull away, you'll see the street poles and how close dry ground is. So it shows you how localized flash floods could be. So they're going to pull away in a second here. So there's a street pole right there. Again, as they lift away, you'll see people standing along the side and relatively dry properties very close by. Okay, Milwaukee, major flood event in July 22, 2010. And one of the things that's interesting with this particular flood event is how people don't always realize how dangerous or toxic, here goes my phone, I'll just ignore that, um, how toxic these events could be. In this particular case, four feet of Russian water poured onto rush hour roads less than an hour after the start of the rain. A sinkhole opened up that was 20 feet deep and 40 feet wide. It, it swallowed a traffic light as well as an SUV. And notice this fact down here, 2 billion gallons of sewage, untreated sewage, discharged into the flood. So that's why when you have floods in, in urban areas, a lot of times you see YouTube videos of people, you know, wading through chest deep water, having fun, oh, look how bad it is, not realizing the kinds of bacteria that are in that water. Um, so I think that's important to remember in urban environments, but in any environment. Even in rural areas, floods often wash through farms, sewage treatment plants, and you know, there's all kinds of fertilizer and stuff in it. So floods can carry some really serious um, materials. Cars. More than 50% of flash flood fatalities occur in vehicles. It only takes about one and a half to two feet of water to displace or to start to float a, a car. Um, when the water is about a foot up on the, the side of the car, it's displacing about 1,500 pounds. And when cars float, they float to the deeper and faster moving water. And they tend to stack up, engine down against each other. This is a, an image from the Rapid City flood of 1972. The cars floated engine down, and where they reached the edge of the flood, they stacked up. For the older folks in the audience, like me, you might remember in 1972, Volkswagen Beetles had their engines in the back. So notice this one is facing a different direction than all the others. Recently, just two years ago, there was a very major flash flood near Brisbane, Australia. And this taken from the town of Toowoomba really is a good image for showing how cars behave in flood. These are unoccupied cars that got swept out of a parking lot. So I'm going to jump ahead in this video, just in the interest of time. But if you watch, look at this car, how it floats engine down. And as soon as they move, they seek out the deeper, faster moving water. That's what, that's what objects are drawn to when they start to float. And this guy's engaging his four-wheel drive so he could pull away. I find it interesting that he's holding an umbrella, even though he's in knee-deep water. I'm not really sure why he was worried about staying dry. Yeah. 
This is occurring within a couple hours. There's another car. You can see it engine down, and it's basically going down the middle of the, the fast-moving part of the channel. So and eventually all these cars kind of get swept away. You can see another one coming down. Again, you just see the way they behave and why it's so difficult to get out of a car that's floating once it's floating. Because if you're the driver, you're in the part of the car that's dipped down into the water and it's moving very fast too. Okay, that's another one. Now something a little bigger. Of course, the TV commercials tell us these are safe. Um, they do have higher clearance, and that allows them to get through water that some cars would flow away in. But it has 18-inch clearance. It weighs 5,000 pounds, 6 feet wide, 18 feet long. If you put a foot of water up on the body of this car, so two and a half feet deep, that one foot of water, given the size of this vehicle, will replace 6,739 pounds, easily enough to float this thing away. So this is my last slide, and it's, it's an... Um, image from the Richmond, Virginia flood of, of 2004. This occurred during rush hour, and I, I showed an image earlier, but basically the water all converged in the downtown area, which is very heavily urbanized, and you can see the lights on. These are occupied vehicles that are kind of dipped engine down. It made it very difficult for rescuers to get people out because the cars are moving, they're crashing into each other. Um, it's interesting when they talk to um, people who, who survived the flood, and most of them did, they talk about those human instincts that are ridiculous, like you hit the brakes or try to use the steering wheel even though your car's floating and it's not going to do any good. Um, but this is a situation, again, in an urban environment um, where the flood came together very quickly after the start of the rain and the vehicles are a very dangerous place to be. There were 12 fatalities in this particular flood event. So to kind of summarize what I went over, the main take-home point with flash floods is they're very fast hydrologic responses to intense rainfall. It's not necessarily the amount of rain, although usually there are pretty significant or heavy amounts involved, but more important, it's how intense it is. It can be a short duration burst of intense rain that triggers a flash flood. There's often a maritime tropical connection in the atmosphere where the moisture is coming from. Even if you live in the northern plains or Alaska or west coast or here in Colorado, by tropical maritime connection, it's that flow. It could be from the Gulf of Mexico. It could be what we call the summer monsoon, the tropical Pacific. It could be what the west coast people and Alaska people might call the Pineapple Express, a connection with the, the tropical Pacific. So even in areas that aren't tropical, like the Gulf Coast and Hawaii, you get these situations where you have transport of moisture from tropical oceans that often play a role in enhancing the rainfall rate and making it more intense. Small basins and alter basins are particularly prone to flash flooding. This includes uh, basins, and again, watershed is a synonym for basin. It includes watersheds that have been deforested, watersheds that have been burnt, and especially watersheds that are urbanized or even suburbanized. The majority of fatalities are vehicle related, I think about 60%, the last count. And so that's, that's it. I put my name here again. Again, I work at the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. We develop training material. It's free online training material. It's mostly geared toward professionals in the um, sciences, but you might find some of it useful. Some of those animations I showed you, like the rain gauges, are in our training material, so you could find those here and certainly ask any questions if you have. Um, but at this point, I'll turn it over to Henry to take questions. Thank you so much, Matt. That was a very, very uh, interesting presentation. Boy, a lot of, a lot of um, fascinating videos here. Uh, and, you know, the National Weather Service has come out with a saying, turn around, don't drown. And that's a, a message for all you guys out there. When you see the water, don't, don't wade through it. Go back and just turn around. And very important. Well, we're going to have some, uh, a chance for you guys to give some questions to Matt. If you would uh, want to type some in now, please indicate your first name and your state with your question. We'll take as many as we can in the next uh, 15 to 25 minutes, and uh, we will uh, we'll do that right now. So we've got a couple questions coming in. Uh, one that came in uh, from Sarah says, can flash flooding from intense hurricanes cause rapid erosion? 
Yeah, now there are two things. When you say rapid erosion, I wonder if you're referring to the, the, the coastal erosion. That We don't classify that as flash flooding. That's coastal flooding or the storm tide, what we call the storm surge. So that's the first real big problem with, with hurricanes that come into the coast is the ocean water that piles up and that gets pushed inland as a, as a very major flood. But perhaps you're referring to the other aspect of hurricanes, the, sometimes the hidden danger, as they move inland, the heavy rain does result in flash flooding and erodes stream channels and, and stuff like that. Hurricane Irene last year was a classic example. The storm surge flooding along the coast, although there was some, uh, was certainly serious, but it was the inland flooding in New Jersey, New York, Vermont, um, that really caused the billion dollar disaster. Jim from, from Maine, Freeport, Maine, says that he's seen many examples of highway culvert washouts uh, up there in Maine, and he went, is wondering if the highway engineers are paying attention to these and, and to the, da the data from Kokoros. Um, I can't say what your highway engineers are doing, and I'm not familiar with exactly that area, but I can tell you something I have seen in different parts of the country I've been in. In older communities, Often the culverts are undersized. Either they were estimated wrong, but more likely, since the culvert was put in, there's been more urbanization upstream, which means more water is coming toward them. In newer developments, you often see detention ponds and retention ponds. These are these depressed excavated areas that are designed to hold excess water that the development otherwise displaces. So if you're talking about an older area, and of course New England does have a lot of older areas, um, it could be that the culverts really were built for a time that it is no longer realistic in terms of what's coming into that, that particular drainage. Thanks, Matt. Here's one from Hillary in Bluefield, West Virginia. She says, in Appalachia, we have natural rural, a natural rural environment, yet we have tremendous flooding events. Can you explain this? Yeah. Um, you, was it West Virginia or Virginia? West Virginia. Okay. Yeah, you know, in the, in the classes I do, we've used a number of cases from the Middle Appalachians, Virginia, North Carolina, and so forth. And just like the Front Range of the Rockies here, the Appalachians provide that really important um, lift of the atmosphere that can really focus heavy rainfall, particularly with landfalling hurricanes, like Hurricane Fran back in 1996. But it doesn't even have to be a hurricane. There are, one of the labs we did was the Madison County, Virginia flood of 1995, just 20 inches of rain in eight hours. But in West Virginia, I don't know exactly where you are. There's also the deforestation issue because of the strip mining. When you remove the forest and you remove the forest litter, you've removed the buffer that could absorb some of that water. So not only are the middle Appalachians prone to flash flooding because you get the tremendous range, you're very close to the tropical waters of the Gulf Stream, but there are areas where there's been deforestation that affect the hydrology and cause more runoff. Here's an interesting one uh, looking at a societal impact. Uh, Doug in New Hampshire says it seems that areas of high risk or flash floods can be identified in advance. Are there any studies that show whether people would act differently if they were warned by signs? Uh, that's actually an interesting question. And there, the Weather Service does try to keep track and, and identify areas that are particularly high risk, in addition to urban areas, you know, burnt areas, and they, they keep track of soil moisture because they know wetter areas might have runoff more quickly than dry areas. So there are um, tools that the professionals use. As far as warning people, um, you know, here in Colorado, there are signs out there that say climb to safety in case of flash flood. Um, I've been to cities that say this is a flash flood prone area. What strikes me when I'm an outsider in a city I'm not familiar with, and I see a sign that says this is a flash flood prone area, often I don't even see where the stream channel is. And I'm I have a pretty trained eye for looking at this stuff, so I think some of the signage could be better about where is the flash flood area and where do they have to be if it's a flash flood area. Um, so we can identify some, some areas, especially in canyons when, when the road is closer to the, um, to the stream. Those are obviously going to be more at risk than where the road is higher up. And when you're traveling at night in a rainstorm, you don't necessarily know how far you are from the stream. So some signage could help. Um, and I think that's a state-by-state -state decision on how you do that signage. This is Nolan. Increasingly in southwestern states, I think it may have started in Texas, but also New Mexico and Arizona, there's more of the automated, uh, like the railroad crossing barriers that on, on some 
areas that are known to have higher risk, they've actually created a barrier system that can be automatically triggered from a remote site to close some of those those roads. I, I think it's not done extensively because of the cost, but yet there are areas that have had a, a history of flash flood and flash flood losses, and that's kind of a neat application of technology. You know, yeah, it's interesting. Texas Hill Country does a lot of that, San Antonio and that area. There was a question from Dave in Arizona, very similar. He says that their roads do not have bridges or culverts, just a sign saying do not enter when flooded. He says this is $100 versus a million dollars for a bridge, uh, but uh, the COE is now requiring more and more bridges. So uh, is this a mistake, I guess he's wondering. if You know, this comes up in professional circles all the time. We call those low water crossings, where you could cross when the water's low or when the creek is dry, but as soon as there's some water, it's dangerous and there's no bridge. It's not just the southwest. There are places like the Ozarks in Missouri have a lot of low water crossings. And the problem is what triggers flooding there is not a big storm. Um, so just a, a garden variety shower can sometimes trigger a dangerous flood in these areas. But you're right, the cost is what prevents them from putting the bridges in. Um, and yeah, in professional circles, people really, they, they worry about that because there are a lot of rescues or, or fatalities in, in those regions where people enter water not recognizing how that it doesn't take a lot of water to float a car. One approach that's being used now as far as keeping people from entering water is not focusing on you're going to die, but focusing on you're going to do $2,000 worth of damage to your car. It seems mm. like some people respond more to that because it's more real that, you know, if water gets in an engine, I have a really big price tag. Here's one from Sandy in Colorado. She uh, asked, or, or he asked, was the 1976 Big Thompson Colorado flood also associated with regenerative convection? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it was a, a storm that regenerated, or a storm system that regenerated over the Big Thompson Canyon over about four hours, produced probably about 12 inches of rain. It was almost a carbon copy of the setup for the Fort Collins storm of 1997. Here's one from Ty in Colorado. He wants to know, in your opinion, how promising is the new s pole radar going to be in ascertaining radar estimated precipitation? Good question, and I didn't bring that up in the talk because I know that's getting technical, but the dual polarization radar, I think, is going to go through a learning curve, so it might not be the most promising thing initially, but I think it's going to be one of the best advantages or biggest adva advances in determining rainfall rates from radar that we've seen um, since the radars first came out. For those that don't know, what dual pole is, Right now, when the radars look at precipitation particles like raindrops, they're just looking at the horizontal um, dimension of it. And raindrops, they're not shaped like those things you see in cartoons, but they tend to be hamburger bun shaped because of the air resistance. They tend to be wider than they are tall. Hailstones tend to be circular. And what the, the dual pole radar is, is it looks at both the vertical and horizontal dimensions, so they give us a feel for the shape of the precipitation particles, so we get a better feel for whether there's water or ice in the cloud so the radars can be better calibrated. So I think it's going to be a huge advance. Here's one from Brian in California. He wants to know what percent do rain gauge windshields help with the catch? Uh, that's a good question. With rain, you know, I, I can't think of what the percent is again. They, they do help. With snow, it's really minimal uh, as far as how they help. Nolan might know the numbers off the top of his head a little bit better than I do, but they do help with rain. Um, it doesn't correct all the error, but it, it makes it better. But, you know, the graphs I've seen with snow, is, that's just a difficult thing to measure no matter what you do. It's, it's better once the snow is on the ground for water supply purposes to try and get what we call core measurement, just take what's on the ground and melt down the liquid in there. And this is Nolan chiming in. Uh, the reason we emphasize gauge placement, uh, you can really achieve a lot of shielding by where you put your gauge. So we say when you're in a very open area, mount that gauge closer to the ground. Why do we ask that? And it's because closer to the ground, the wind speeds are lower. You have less of that wind undercatch effect. In urban areas where there's lots of obstacles, you get a lot of natural shielding, so you don't have high wind velocities at the top of the gauge. Uh, and when Matt was talking about wind speeds, uh, uh, losing about 1% gauge 
catch for every one mile an hour wind. That's the wind speed at the top of the gauge, not up at 10 meters where your wind measurements are usually taken. Nolan, here's one for you from Jim from San Antonio. He says, how fast does a Kokora significant rainfall report get to flood responders, and how many reports does it take before you know a flood is building? Well, we, the reason I keep encouraging people to submit uh, significant weather reports is that information reaches your National Weather Service office within seconds. Uh, and it may take you a minute or two to type it in, uh, but that once you type it in and hit submit, that's going to be at your weather service office within seconds, and they will then be judging that measurement that they're looking at with respect to the radar at that time. And I can't tell you enough how important these observations are. Even if you just got a quarter of an inch in the last hour, but you can tell there was a heavy storm around you, that can give the Weather Service a much better handle on how well the radar is performing. They're going to make a lot of their real-time assessments based on radar, but they're going to judge the credibility of the radar based on these real-time reports. Then they're also going to rely on your reports of the type of flooding that's being observed uh, and the magnitude of stream flow, et cetera, what you're seeing. So it gets there quick and it's important information. Please learn how to use those significant weather reports and use them. Yeah, and I should also point out, if you observe flooding when you're not by your rain gauge location, you could still do a significant report. There, there's a choice there. You could say, I'm not at my location, but you could just say, I see flooding on such and such creek. Um, if you're a, a registered Kokoraz user, they will use those reports. And I'll mention again, how did Kokoraz get started? It got started because of that Fort Collins flash flood of 1997. Radar estimated the precipitation very, very poorly with that particular storm. We had very few spotter reports. We had just insufficient data to go on, and just a few timely reports that night could have conceivably saved lives, and we've been committed to engaging the public in better precipitation monitoring ever since. Here's one for you guys from Joan in, in Western, Washington's, Western Washington State. She says, why are we having 100-year floods every few years? And she's especially certain rivers that flow into the Puget Sound. Uh, well, there are a couple reasons. Um, one, uh, of course, a 100-year flood, the definition doesn't mean it should just come every 100 years. Um, you could get you know, two in a row and then not have another one for 200 years. But the bigger reason is um, there's two. One, we might have those estimated incorrectly. They may actually occur more frequently. Those are just estimates. Um, urbanization, as I talked about, is going to change those statistics. 100-year floods will occur more often when you've developed an area. I don't know exactly the drainage you're talking about in Washington. And then the other, which it's harder to um, assign attribution, but there's a lot of study now, is the climate isn't stationary either. So is it raining more or are you getting more rain relative to snow in those areas? Stuff like that will increase um, the chances of, of more flooding than you had in the past. Uh, ben from Oklahoma writes that uh, it seems they are in Oklahoma they have a, uh, problems with cutoff lows and training effects. Uh, I guess uh, how to minimize municipal flooding there and I guess in other states where we seem to have a lot of training. By, by training, I just want to make sure, are you talking about, I don't know if you could ask them, the, the storms that go over the same area, what I was talking about, what regenerative thunderstorms? Because training is the other word used for that. I don't know if he's yeah. referring to training like teaching people. Or? Oh, I think he means the, the training effect, like you're saying, the, okay, the, yeah. the cutoff low. So, yeah, yeah when, you have a, when you have a cutoff low, of course, your system isn't moving a lot, and a lot of the features are nearly stationary. So you do have this constant burst of rain in the same area, regenerative, or what we call the training effect. They train over the same area. So you said you're with the municipality, um, and that is going to be a real big problem in municipalities. Um, if, if you see that kind of a situation coming together, um, typically the weather service is paying attention to those patterns where they know there are going to be excess rains in, in certain areas, and your urban environments, of course, are going to respond more than your rural environments. Um, I'm not sure I answered the question. Can you repeat it again, Henry? 
Yeah, let me let me get back to it here a second. He says that in Oklahoma we seem to have more problems with cutoff lows and the training effect. How to minimize municipal flooding in those situations? Okay, well, of course you would have more of the problems with training when you have cutoffs, as I just said, because the features are sort of quasi-stationary. Minimizing the flooding, you're not going to minimize the rain. That's what nature's going to give you. So it, it really is going to be an analyzing whether or not your storm culvert system and detention ponds and stuff like that are adequate enough, what you're getting. And um, if they're not, you can change it. It's also public education to, to make sure people don't go driving into areas they shouldn't be during big rain events. So that would minimize the impact. Thanks, Matt. Here's one from Chuck in California. He wants to know, one foot of water will float how much weight? One foot of water up on a typical car, on the body of the car, according to the FEMA slide I showed, would um, displace 1,500 pounds. Okay. Here's one from West Virginia. Uh, would it be helpful if radar was mounted on mountain ridge tops? No. Um, and this is a question with radar locations that we always come up with. The higher you locate them, the less you're going to see low-level information. The trade-off is if they're in valleys, then you, you get blocked by the mountains. But at least when they're in valleys, they're usually in areas where a lot of people live. At least you get a good feel for what's occurring in the low levels there. So the trick with radar is you always want them as low elevation as possible, but with as little blocked beam as possible. So there's a mixture in the country. There are some that are on ridge tops because it's the only way they're going to get some coverage and others that are in valleys um, because they need that low level information if it's an urban environment. Nolan, here's one for you from Tom from San Diego. He wanted to know, is there a specific windshield for the Kokoros gauge that can be purchased? There isn't. Uh, we have and I think uh, this is a good question we might put out in a message of the day here in the in the near future, but I highly recommend natural shielding when possible. Uh, when I say ideal natural shielding can be vegetation, low bushes, shrubs, uh, uh, in grassland areas of the dry desert southwest, you always wonder what good is a sagebrush. Sagebrush are very good at serving as natural windshields. So I prefer natural shielding uh, when possible, but that's not always an option. Uh, let, let me take a little time and we can put together some suggestions. We do have volunteers who have built some re very sophisticated windshields specifically for this purpose. Thanks, Nolan. Here, here's one from Greg in Texas. He wants to know <clears throat> what factors are used to adjust uh, the radar from our rain, Kokoros rainfall reports? Um, well, radar adjusted, or yeah, radar adjusted with rain gauges. There's basically a bias that's computed. So they look, for instance, over a period of an hour, what the the, the radar is showing at a a number of rain gauge locations. They don't just use one because one single rain gauge might be erroneous. But when they get a feel of what a number of gauges are showing, it could be five or six in a small area over an hour and they look at what the radar is showing at those rain gauge points, they just compute what the difference is and compute what we call a bias. So let's just say, for instance, that the gauges are all showing twice as much as the radar. Then you'd want to try and, I mean, that's a big bias, but you'd want to try and adjust the radar up to match those gauges is, is how it's done. The Kokoraz gauges in particular aren't used for real-time bias because they're not five-minute reports like the automated gauges are but they are used after the fact. They're really good storm total reports to, to see how the overall system performs. So they are very important. They're just not used on an hourly basis because they're not available on an hourly basis. Okay, here's one from Wisconsin and uh, they wanted to know that they've had uh, rainfalls greater than 10 inches in under six hours and have had bridges and culverts wash out. Would that be considered a flash flood? Yes. Um, I'm assuming the, that rainfall, what you said 10 inches in six hours, that the flood occurred probably within six hours of that peak rainfall. And yes, that sounds like a flash flood to me. I'd have to look at the timing of it. But, you know, there's a whole spectrum between what we call flash flood and what we call river floods. And, you know, it's not like there's really a magic number that six hours is just arbitrary. But basically, flash floods 
are the short duration end of the whole flooding spectrum. Here's one from uh, Jim in Montana. He's noticed that developers seem to be fighting an area being designated as a flood zone. And uh, have you guys seen much of this? And, and how could they educate the public on, on uh, when this is happening? Um, I'm not sure specifically on the Montana case, but yes, you see that all the time where where there's an argument between by flood zone, meaning if you do development in this area, you're going to either put property or people at risk, or you're going to affect downstream areas with a greater risk of flooding, and usually it's a combination of both. And what new developments are often required to do, as I mentioned earlier, is, is try to accommodate the water they're displacing by developing retention ponds and, and, and things like that that will hold some of the excess water. What's really interesting is places that have had bad floods, usually for about 10 or 20 years, there's this sense of we can't build there, we have to protect the floodplain, but then people sort of forget. A new generation comes along and the pressures in urban environments to build those areas that have a proven history of flooding is still there. So that's something that's being fought between commercial interests and, and floodplain management all the time. Here's a question that comes in from Mark, and, and maybe many people might be thinking this. It, what is the difference between a tsunami and a flash flood? Are they the same thing? No, tsunamis, I mean, they are both very rapid onset yeah. floods, so in that sense, they're the same thing. Tsunamis come from the ocean, and they're triggered usually by earthquakes. They could be undersea volcanoes and landslides as well. But it's, um, it's, it's an ocean wave, you know, a giant ocean wave that comes in, often triggered by earthquakes, that does result in a very rapid onset severe flood. But I'm glad you asked that question because tsunamis aren't just a big wave. Um, they're a wave that may not be that big, might be 15 or 20 feet, but they're like a half a mile long. So they really are floods from the sea rather than a wave that we think of when we go surfing. They are floods from the sea that come in. So in that sense, you think of it as a flash flood, but it's not, you know, the definition of a flash flood is really more related to, to rainfall or dam failure or stuff. Okay, we're going to take a couple more questions here, and, and then we'll finish up for the day. Uh, Kathy in Oregon wants to know, and Nolan, this may be for you, would it be helpful to submit wind speed with rainfall measurements in significant weather reports? Never hurts. I mean, uh, many intense storms are a combination of heavy rain and strong winds, and when you see reports of strong winds accompanying storms, then we often have a sense that our gauges may be under catching. So that can be a useful addition to the to your current reports. Okay. Well, I think that we've answered most of the questions today. We're going to, uh, any ones that we have not, uh, we'll forward them on to Matt, and hopefully he'll be able to get back to you in the next week or so. We really thank you, uh, Matt, for being with us today. Very informative. Matt's a good friend of Kokoros right down the road here in Boulder. And uh, again, thanks so much for being with us. Um, our next webinar will be on Thursday, May 3rd at 1 p.m. Eastern. Ron Holly will be talking about lightning. That looks like a very interesting subject. Uh, Ron has done a lot of studies on lightning and impacts, lightning deaths, and, 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 and stuff like that. So if you're interested in that one, you can sign up on our Kokoros webpage on the Weather Talk. Uh, we'll also uh, Weather Talk. Uh, Logo. So if you go to our webpage, click on the logo, you'll be able to sign up there. We'll be running a message of the day here shortly, and we'll make that available. So once again, Matt, thank you so much. Uh, Nolan, well, thank you, and thank you, well. everyone, for your attention. And we'll, uh, we'll see you guys uh, here in a couple weeks for our next webinar. Have a good day now. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody.